Testing, testing. Is this microphone actually working for remote people? Can remote folk hear me? Maybe? Yay! Okay, so we have rearranged the agenda very slightly. And we will first be having the, um, what's the actual full name? Um, where is? Yeah, where did my packets go? Measuring the impact of RPKI ROV. 
And that's going to be by Kun, who's presenting remotely. I guess, actually, before we should do that, we should first do the hello, everybody, and welcome to Philadelphia. I'm Warren. This is Chris. You're in the IEPG meeting, which is a informal gathering of network operators that happens before the IETF actually starts. So technically, you don't have to be registered for the meeting, but I'm guessing everybody probably is anyway. So this is us. Um, hello and welcome again. And let's get started. I guess I, how's this going to work? Don't, would you like us to share the slides or do you want to ask to share and you move them, whichever you would prefer? I believe I asked to share the slides, but then. Uh, okay, let's... Chris, uh, click the button and take it away. Ah, lovely. Uh, so, yes, uh, I want to talk about uh, where did my packets go? Basically, uh, we do RPKI ROV, so what impact does it have? Um, Firstly, so why do we actually care about RPKI? I mean, I would argue that, okay, for some of us, it's probably job security, but generally speaking, we care not so much about RPKI intrinsically, but we care about where our packets actually go to and where the place that they go to is actually the place that we intended our packets to end up in. And RPKI ROV is one of the ways we try to make sure that they end up in the intended place. Um, there is, however, a slight issue with that. So what's the problem? <laughs> oh, uh, that is a uh, slash 21 that is announced by AS3333, so the right to see. Uh, and we have uh, the same prefix as, as a, a slash tw uh, 24 announced by AS666, which I called Evil Corp, which I know it's not the right name because, but hey, uh, this discussion about whether we use reserved prefix for documentation or not, that has been going on forever, and I will gladly follow that tradition. Um, so they both announced that uh, pre uh, prefix to serve, and let's for this uh, example say that serve doesn't do ROV. So they receive both of them, accept both of them, and forward both of them to the University of Twente. So that's the one on the right. So if the University of Twente were to do RPKI ROV, then it would look at both of those uh, BGP announcements and then see, okay, hey, that one that goes from 1103 to 666, hey, that's that's invalid according to this the ROAS that I have. So I'm going to drop that. Great. Okay. Now we have the, only the other route available. Except that if we send a packet to, let's say, 193.0.1.1, then we take a look at what route, the routes we have. We only uh, we've, uh, discarded the one because that is more specific, but we still have, still have the one that goes to uh, the right NCC. We forward, we send that packet to the one, the next hop, so serve. And surf then says, hey, I know a more specific route, and I know, so I know a more specific destination. Let's just send it to Evercorp anyway. So even though I do, or the University of Twente does RPKI ROV, that doesn't really mean that my packet then ends up at the, what is considered valid according to the RPKI. The inverse is also true. If SURF were to do RPKI ROV and the University of Twente wouldn't do RPKI ROV and would receive the same, somehow it would also receive the slash 24, then even though it would, uh, the University of Twente would consider that route, then it would end up at SURF and SURF says, yeah, but that's, no, that's invalid. So I'm going to send it to the right NCC anyway. So then it does end up in the right place, even though they don't do ROV. So, um, this is what we want to look into. Basically, does this actually happen in real life and what's the impact? Um, so quickly about the experiment that we set up. Um, for the experiment, we have one AS, that is AS211321. That's the, an AS used by Nano Labs that I was able to borrow. Um, we have two servers actually. Uh, one of them is at Colaclue in Amsterdam. Uh, Colaclue is, um, Reasonably, uh, rather well connected. Actually, it has a lot of peer, peers, uh, quite a few uh, 
tier one upstreams and one at Vulture in Sydney, which is also reasonably well connected. Uh, not as well connected as Code Clue, but still, it's it's not invisible to the outside world. Um, we are announcing some prefixes, namely two A O four B nine O five as a slash forty two. We have also a row for that that is, has a max length of also forty two um, for this AS. So uh, that one is valid. We announced that one from Vulture. That's what the blue triangle means. Um, we also announced 2A04B905 as a slash 43. So that one is invalid according to the rows that we have. Uh, but it is more specific. So if you look at just BGP, then it would be more specific. So we choose that. But if you do RPTI ROV, then you consider it invalid. So you choose this slash 32. And then uh, to check whether you do RPTI ROV, we have a slash 48 that is has an AS0 row associated to with it. So um, if you do, do RPKI ROV, then you wouldn't even send your traffic to your upstream unless you use something like a default route. Um, you basically, you would just discard the packet because you have no route available for that prefix. And if you don't do RPKI ROV, you would send it up to your upstream. Um, all these IP addresses also have their IP4 equivalents, namely in 203.119.22.23 uh, and the others below there. But for convenience sake, I will just keep talking about the IPv6 ones because otherwise this becomes a very convoluted uh, talk. So what we did, we set up three RPGI publication points. Um, we have parents.rov.punvanhoven.nl, which is uh, hosted on 2A04, B905, 8001. So um, this is inside the slash 32 announcement, but outside the slash 43 announcement. So this is always ends up at Vulture in Australia, it, because that's the only route you could possibly take, because that's the only place it's announced. Then we have child.rov.kunvanhoven.nl. This is at uh, 2A04 B905 uh, which uh, is actually um, inside the slash 32 and inside the slash 43. Um, so depending on whether you do RPKI ROV and your upstreams, where your upstream send your packets to, this ends up at either Colaclue in Amsterdam or in Vulture in Australia. Um, and then we have invalid.rov.kunvanhoven.nl, which is at the invalid prefix. So if you hit this, then you are likely not go, uh, if you are likely not doing RPKI ROV. So um, Yes, that's what I said. So, um, quick intermezzo about why RPKI publication points, because while well, every measurement that you do on the internet has a bias, we want to look at uh, networks that were more likely to do ROV than the average. Uh, RPKI publication points also, gen because uh, validators uh, look load the data at least once an hour, they generate a nice steady stream of traffic. Uh, so this was we thought, hey, this this might be a good way to to actually measure this, or at least get a feeling for this. But uh, mind you, this doesn't say something about the World Wide Web, of course, because uh, most people or most organizations are still not doing RPKI ROV, um, and the artists are, and most that don't do ROV also don't run a validator because you don't run a validator for fun, or at least not 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 mo not most people I know. Um, so this is actually the slide that, that most people um, are waiting for. This is the, the results. Um, this is a, a, a small table. Um, the uh, uh, value at the top right is actually the value that you would most likely expect, namely the, the uh, amount of unique IP addresses that drop invalid, so didn't manage to reach invalid.rov.convenhoven.nl and ended up at uh, Vulture in Sydney, so at the valid location. However, as you can also see, there is in the top left um, uh, also quite quite a few that, even though they did drop in valid, they still ended up at what would uh, I would say is the wrong location or the unintended location if you look at it from the um, RPKI perspective. Um, so that's the uh, category that's. Well, I mean, didn't even though they did RPKI ROV, 
they're upstream sending their packets to the to a location that they thought hey we know something more specific and then it was not the place where the uh, originator expected it to go however the, the we also see the inverse because for the all those that don't drop in pellets uh, quite a large portion large portion is actually uh, secured or secured um, does go to the intended location according to the RPKI merely because their upstreams do. So this is quite an um, interesting, uh, was quite an interesting first uh, uh, to see this, especially this this bottom one because uh, I at least didn't expect this. I didn't expect that this would have such an impact, but uh, luckily it does. So I would say that. Uh, I, I'm not going to say whether this is a positive message or, or a negative message. That's something that you may decide, but um, it's quite interesting to see. I believe. Um, so during these measurements, we we ran into some challenges. Um, the first challenge is actually quite simple. Uh, at first, 99% of traffic that went to code loop, and now that was a bit that seemed a bit strange because why would all traffic go to code clue i mean some at least some people will do rpki or rov and drop in palace right well i mean vulture didn't do rov we knew that but um they would apparently if their traffic reached their edge they would say think hey i know a more specific route so they would redirect it to another tier one and then it would make a loop around the world and end up in amsterdam i've seen trace routes where the packet starts in Amsterdam, goes around the world, reaches uh, Australia, and then goes around the other side of the world again. So if you need the BGP scenic routing, then this is, this is a way to do it. Um, not really efficient and also, uh, well, problematics for, for what we wanted to test. Uh, we managed to solve this by uh, announcing a more specific, the most specific filter as well, and then uh, adding a BGP community so it doesn't export outside of filter which is a bit of an ugly hack, but it works and was for our measurements uh, good enough. However, if you don't do this, which most people won't, then uh, even though the, you might do RPK ROV, if you announce something at Vulture and someone else on the world is, announces more, something more specific, then all that traffic will go away. Um, yeah, something to think about. Um, another thing, which uh, because IPv4 is difficult to get nowadays because it has run out for the last five years or so. I did, um, we initially ran everything on IPv6 and IPv6 only, which we thought, okay, networks that do IPv6 run a validator that on a, uh, on a machine that also supports IPv6, right? Well, the answer to that is um, sometimes yes, but often also no. So we would see that, hey, why don't you understand what our route is? Hey, um, we, we I, I think, why don't you uh, don't our row? Oh, wait, wait, we you don't do IPv6 on your validator, even though your network support IPv6. Uh, and interestingly enough, sometimes networks had multiple validators running, and some of them uh, on machines, some where some machines supports IPv4 only, and some also support IPv6. So that, that triggered internal alerts. A lot of help, awful lot of fun, basically. Um, message being that either run make sure that your publication point is, uh, is available on both ip4 and ip6 or just basically manage we or we need, need to get into a world where running ip6 only is actually feasible which i mean i would love to see but that's uh, i'm afraid probably not going to be realistic so yeah that that's um it basically for me we we've seen that that merely doing rov and dropping in fellas does not necessarily mean that your traffic goes to the intended location we, we knew that from a theoretical point of view but we now also just did it in the wild and we've seen the same behavior and also uh, the more varied your upstreams are the more important doing rov is because what what we've seen in our case where vulture was our only upstream um vulture made sure that we didn't receive any rov traffic um like likewise if, if for the university of twente because the university of twente also has one upstream the whether the university of twente does rov or not is has a very limited impact on where traffic actually goes um if you're interested in a live map of seeing data coming in to our uh, rpki publication points and also where to your network that you're on actually takes you to then you can do so by visiting rov.com.nl 
um, if you were more interested in reading an article about this than hearing me talk about it, it's available on Gripe Labs on that URL or just Google it. Um, and lastly, I want to thank the people at Anandit Labs and the Ripe NCC for letting me do BGP things with their resources, which um, luckily nothing went wrong, otherwise they would have taken the blame. Uh, so that's it for me. Um, I'd like to open the floor for questions or um, comments if there's time for that. Yep, we have a few minutes for questions if there is anyone either in the room or online. Going once, going twice. Don't see any questions, but People can also obviously, you know, email the presenters directly or Cohen or Jackson. So thank you very much. And now I think we will do the Dane Portal um, presentation, which I believe you will be presenting from your own laptop. Yes. Excellent. So, uh, yep, you can. You can, as long as you don't mind, turn around and clicking the button. Or if you put the, on that end of the table, yeah, we can no, shift yeah, down yeah. and you can stand there and you can face the audience. Yeah, that would be perfect. Testing one, two, three. Oh, we can actually keep that one too, because that's on the side. Excellent. Thank you guys for <laughs> the accommodations. No worries. Uh, so this. And then you click the ask to share button and somebody will click OK. Ask to share screen. Yes, I want to share my screen. Entire screen, indeed. Oh, there's the mirror parallel. Dimension. Infinite tunnel of meat echoes. <laughs> all right. Just make want to make sure remote people can see this and it all looks okay. I will assume so. Alrighty, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm Minar, and we've got some guys here, Pavan. We have some of me over there, I'm sure you know. Um, we're uh, graduate students at George Mason University, and we have um, working with the Modular Security Lab. And really, we want to show off some of the cool tools we've been working on uh, in the subject of Dane protocols, really bringing them to life to power SMIME specifically. But first, let's uh, jump into a little bit of setup. So Dane is a powerful protocol suite. Are we good to go? All right, cool. Make sure you keep a, you know, your face. Always in, your face. in front of my face, gotcha. If this doesn't work, this work. This works. Good note. All right, let me try to be a little more 50 cent here. Um, <laughs> Dane is a powerful protocol suite. It really makes doing security and privacy easier, right? But what can we do to make Dane easier? That's kind of the question that inspires us. So, for the everyday person, why can't we simply turn on secure messaging on the internet? Now, I know what you're thinking. Hey, we could do messaging on certain platforms and apps, right? We got you know, WhatsApp, Signal. Uh, we got like our organizational PKI. We can you know, do email really easily. Um, but should we really be limited on the internet for you know, proprietary platforms and that kind of PKI boundaries, right? And what about usability? To get to that next stage, we kind of want to be sure that everyday users and operators that make the gear spin are not burdened by the overhead of having to manage doing uh, you know, secure messaging, secure object sharing, and whatnot. So the idea is, like what HTTPS did for transport security, we want any entity to be able to transact end-to-end -end secured with uh, secured objects with any others over the internet, right? on like a wide scale. And this is for all sorts of use cases. So that's why we're launching this basic research into how Dane can unlock these long-needed protections for those uses, it's like mHealth, smart and connected cities, CTI sharing, something I'm currently working on personally, and then we got 5G and XG, all these hot topics. Dane can really bring that to the next level for those protections across the internet. So <laughs> let's start by securing one of those basic protocols, right? If we can work with the Model T, we can work with the Tesla. What's something that everybody uses? Email. And what is this going to allow us to do? It's going to let us find out exactly what people need to make end-to-end -end internet security seamless and turn on everywhere. And the catchphrase here is kind of to make it invisible. So for that, we need to make usable tools, right? 
making it easy. Well, securing email with Dane, if that's our use case, we need the tools. We need kind of two sides of the equation here. We need to be able to set up Dane, right? It requires some level of work from domain holders on the DNS. And you know, we want to make that easy for them. And we also want to use the search from Dane on the user side, on the clients and the MUAs that the users will use. So that's a lot of uses, that is. Um, <laughs> they'll be able to do email easily with the tools that we made to really show that off. So for the first one, we made the cert management portal, daneportal.net. And then we made the MUA add-on called Courier. So some fancy names there. We'll show them off, don't worry. And really, the goal here, well, a little too far. The goal here is to find out what people need to make end-to-end -end security default, as I said. We do know one thing for sure. One thing that people definitely need is uh, key management, right? And cert discovery. And we got a lot of solutions for those. But you know, as I kind of implied, Dane is kind of an excellent answer, right? And we just need to make use the tools to make it easy. Daneportal.net. OK, I'm accidentally clicking on the thing here, sorry. Um, it's an open source federated cert management system. And I'll show you what that means. Uh, and a dedicated DNS infrastructure as well to make Dane easy, right? And literally, the way it works is domain holders will enable Dane for their DNS sign zone. And the email users will simply manage their certs in like a delegated manner for specifically the emails they are given control over to the degree that makes sense for the organization. So let's go ahead and see. Uh, these are screenshots, but we can get the idea. Just hop on daneportal.net, and you can uh, start to enable Dane, create a new user like you would normally imagine these online portals to use, and log in. And suddenly on the first page, we'll see this uh, dashboard page where users can Add their, uh, see their email addresses and zones. So this is just kind of like a subset of the page here. But uh, basically, uh, down over here, if a new admin, or somebody that owns a dome, the domain holder, URI, wants to enable Dane for their zone, they'll go ahead and try to claim it. Now, here, I can try to claim example.com, even though I don't own it. Anybody can claim any zone. And they will uh, need to actually verify it, obviously. And the flow here is pretty straightforward. We just use the Acme protocol. Every, uh, to prove ownership, they just need to add that TXT record in their zone and have DNSSEC enabled. And we'll verify that straight through. And it'll, uh, we'll go ahead and try to hook it up, basically, to finish the delegation, just like any normal DNSSEC zone. Or, uh, we had the NS record, DS record, blah, blah, blah. You know the stuff. So this is pretty straightforward for uh, kind of delegations. Now, this is the uh, interesting part. So with Dane, we can do kind of the zone, Dane zone management. Our portal will actually create the Dane zone for you, <laughs> enable Dane. Whereas the admins, the actual domain holders, have full control. They retain control over the uh, keys here. They can turn it on and turn it off, have it accessible. And you know, how do you check that it's actually active? I'm doing the same thing, sorry. How do you check that it's active is, well, you use some kind of tool like SexSpider that will go through and make sure that the delegation works. Because DNSSEC, right, the SEC part, is to, it's to uh, you know, make sure Dane requires that, basically. Now we can go ahead and add the domain. This is the part where email users can uh, be able to manage their own certs. Now this is the uh, part where we go ahead and let another user on Dane Portal manage their own certs on their email address. So here we got John Doe on the picture. And well, we added him. And you can see that uh, when you go back to the dashboard, you can go ahead and click through and manage his own data on Dane Portal. So this is another screenshot showing the uh, page where John Doe will be able to uh, set a cert. So we can just add that, add the cert on this page. And uh, over here is pretty interesting to note the Dane-specific uh, protocol um, usage selector matching. If anybody's familiar with those, that's all, those options are there. The defaults are given to be the most permissive and the um, most complete. So those defaults just allow you to start doing uh, secure email. And once again, we give the ability just to do a quick self-signed cert as well. But you know. That's just a standard open SSL, not too much fanciness there. We can download it and use that cert. Now, John Doe, go ahead. He went ahead and added his cert here. And uh, his, well, he could just toggle it active if he wants. And he's good to go, right? You can start doing secure email just as easy as that. And just another thing to note there, where you know, you can just toggle it on and off. That's not really that easy in classic PK, is it? Cool. So we saw how that was making Dane pretty easy. This is a straightforward flow. The admin added that zone, and then the email users can, in a federated manner, manage their own certs on that um, on the Dane zone. So yeah, feel free to check it out. We got more uh, links over here. Now we saw that first half, so we jump ahead and so how users can actually have it auto-resolve Dane certs on Career. 
in their MUAs to find out what users need to make end-to-end -end security a default. And really, the motivation for this is here. We don't really have wide-scale EDE security, but by observing our tools in action, we can find out what makes sense if we are to make EDE default. So to that end, we uh, kind of instrumented our next tool as a live experiment, where really any one of us, you guys, can help us get some real numbers on the human puzzle piece in security automation. So just to really quickly jump in, we'll show how easy it is with Career, right? Uh, 10.30, you've still got 20 minutes, so 25 minutes. Okay. Alrighty, in that case, I'll go ahead and show this live on, well, first, when you're trying to hook it up, what we added a cert on Dane portal, right? So that means your cert is available on Dane. You just need that private key installed in your MUA. Now, all MUAs and OSs have their own keychains and all kinds of crazy stuff in order to do that. With Career, it's pretty straightforward. You just put it into the settings and just hook it up like a normal file. Choose your key file and you're good to go. Now you can jump into a secure email conversation with a stranger. So I'm actually show this off. Why not? So in Thunderbird, this already has Career installed. I can, you know, do something fun. Just go ahead and write an email to Pavan here. And then the email could be, you know, anything. Our top secret uh, communications that needs uh, uh, encryption and all that. So we can, you know, hide whatever we want. But the idea is that we can do full HTML email. We've got the ability to add pictures and all sorts of emojis and things like that. And uh, we'll go ahead and send this. To Pavan. And uh, you just saw what I did there. And real quick, on this page, you, you saw a little hint of it. It went ahead and encrypted the email and then did something fancy with like an attachment and then just sent it natively, right? And on the other end, well, whenever it comes in, there you go. So this top secret email, it comes in as a, like a, with this tag that's basically said that it's encrypted. That allows the uh, Outlook side, for example, to go ahead and read this in standard SMIME but it's just doing the processing for us. And it'll tell us that it was encrypted and that it was signed. So both this is possible because both me and Pavan have our certs on Dane, despite us not sharing any keys or having it installed on our own operating systems or clients, Dane allows us to do this very seamlessly, right? Now I can seamlessly reply as well. And you know, I could say something like this, thanks. And Pavan uh, could have that. And you can see on this view, like we're conveniently given the decrypted email uh, just as a reference and to be able to send. And for uh, specifically on the Outlook side, all you got to do is to toggle on these. And then you can toggle on signing as well. And you're good to go. It'll send it signed and encrypted in the conversation view. So you see another reply to this, once again encrypted. Now let's see how it looks on my end whenever it comes back. So um, here it goes. Top secret. Now on the Thunderbird side, we'll just go ahead and decrypt it. And you can actually see the conversation very seamless. Verified, decrypted, gives us all that info. So real easy to use for any everyday users. Now let's come back to the slides. If I am not, oh, sorry, there you go. So you, you can even see it with, you know, funny things like, you know, cat pics if you want. <laughs> and uh, it all works. So just a quick rundown of the details. So secure messages are sent as standard sort of PKCS7 SMIME objects. And to kind of avoid stepping on the standard flow of email, emails, they are sent as attachments um, in order to retain kind of the cryptographically secure thing from end to end. And Dane cert resolution is handled natively, silently and directly. So um, we're not using any kind of like listener or uh, server or anything like that that some implementations use. Rather, this is done completely natively within the add-on environment. So these are standard Outlook and Thunderbird add-on with no extra softwares that are up and running. But really, these installation flows, honestly, you could, uh, if you're curious, you can check out that uh, email. Um, site's got more of the info on the installation and whatnot. But what I wanted to highlight was these aren't just convenient tools. They are convenient, sure, I hope you agree. But I mean, this is a vital part of our research to discover what people need and expect to make EV security a default at scale. So what do people need? Well, we've created these options page, right? For the interest of time, I didn't run through them on the actual demo, but I hope uh, you can appreciate that. Well, maybe we have to do some extra clicking there, especially maybe on the Outlook side, we have to go ahead and uh, manually toggle on for each uh, uh, email. Maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we want to have it automated so that every email, you're going to sign it by default, right? And every email, you might try to encrypt it if they can find a cert on Dane. 
You know, that's the kind of seamless thing we can go for. Maybe that's what users want. Just configure it to their needs, right? But it's not just what users want. It's what we can find out about what users want. So when to be silent versus explicit. Like, for example, with private keys, you know, you can think of a use case where a, you, you can have a separate keys for signing and encrypting, or you could just have a single key for both, right? There's, there's different people that need different things. But it's really being able to understand this, you know, actually seeing this in action and seeing what the numbers will help us know that how this correlates with the use, the use case of those individuals and the other settings that they've used, what they expect effectively. And this is where our study comes in. We are conducting an IRB approved study where users can opt into an anonymous user study, right? And it's basically on the options page, you can just to toggle it on. And really, you can help us see what the shape of the needed security is. When accepted, these specific toggles, just you know, the kind of anonymous general ones, will be shared as statistics to our telemetry server, along with the uh, DOE server that we're using for uh, the DNS resolution. But only, obviously, if it's public. So only the public information. Users can optionally answer some basic demographic queries to really uh, zone in that info as well to support the statistics that we're getting. And it does not invade your privacy in any way. The telemetry is shared only in specific times when you change your settings. And then it never tracks anything about your emails, only noting the set default configs. And naturally, you have the right to be forgiven. You can toggle off at any time. And it's completely anonymous. And you can request all your data to be removed if you ever did toggle it on. And we can't do it alone, right? We're trying to find the results that let us automate and enable security on the internet. And for that, we greatly appreciate your participation. Try out our tools. And go ahead and toggle that on if you feel you will let us actually see this stuff in action. So we can step back into the big picture. Dane as an architecture lets us make end-to-end -end security more seamless for every person on the internet, right? We recall in the past that ITF made this push for HTTPS everywhere, right? And we now live in a world where the internet scale transport security is kind of solved. It's a default. Everybody expects it. You see that lock on the browser. It's all good, right? We believe that sort of ubiquity should be the case for internet scale object security, end-to-end -end security, right? Where any random entity on the internet, not just some public server, could transact with other entities in a secured manner seamlessly. But we shall start with the tools for email security, as you saw in this presentation. And this is just a proving grounds, though. Going forward, if you help us find what users need, you know, trying them out, joining our study, then we can further our research on the new uh, uses for Dane. That I mentioned, you know, cyber threat intelligence and M Health, smart cities and IoT devices to be what users actually need. And that's where I'll leave you guys off in. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions or uh, comments? I'll be uh, out here as well to chat for anyone. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. So we have Jared and Peter in the queue. I guess take it away, Jared. Oh, Jared's in person. Hello, Jared. Hello. Ooh. Um, can you differentiate here between what you mean between security and privacy? Because there's a lot of equivalencies that the IETF specifically talks about for security, where I think many of us know that HTML email uh, is very good at violating your individual privacy. And encapsulating that transport inside of TLS doesn't really actually make that communication any more private uh, than you know than it was perhaps previously, because the assertion here is that this will make my communications more secure, but if I'm still rendering the same HTML, my privacy is still likely to be very violated by the people who want to engage in those act those types of activities, and the community has done a very poor job of differentiating between those two, and I'd like to hear kind of how you think this enhances. Um, the, the two different parts, because for this, this seems like an awful lot of work for an organization to go through to get a secure transport um, for the messaging back and forth, which is already afforded by, for example, enabling TLS. So that's a perfect question, because that's exactly part of the point with um, trying to look at Dane. It's not just about the transport. You know, we have HTTPS for TLS transport security. Dane is looking at end-to-end -end security. So the objects themselves are secure at the ends of them. If uh, uh, I'm sorry if I misunderstood your question. The... Yeah, but that doesn't mean that the object I'm downloading isn't going to infect my machine or go and violate the security properties of my device. 
which is one of my major concerns here, is that uh, you don't. You, this isn't actually affording any sort of additional security for the device. Sure, that is actually a good point. And really, um, our goal here was to focus, zone in on enabling Dane for S mime specifically. So the S mime protocol that it currently exists, right? Now, extensions to that protocol could definitely do some work in that regards to making sure email has objects that are like the, the contents of email, the HTML emails and whatnot are more conscious of our privacy, right? Specifically, but looking at exactly S mime as the protocol exists today uh, is kind of the objective of the tools that we have. So implementing Dane specifically, but that is an excellent point and you know, worth looking into in the future. Oh, it seems like we have another question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, okay, whatever. I'll just spend. Um, yes, I have a question about um, Dane Portal works behind the scenes. So when, when you uh, kind of claim a domain, mm -hmm. then the domain owner somehow adds the token in their DNS. Okay, that's fine. And then once that's done, when I create users in the Dane portal and do stuff with the keys, how does that actually relate to that domain? And why would a certain, uh, let's say, email client, for example, contact the Dane portal server about this? Um, is it actually like that, or is some information put into the customer's domain, DNS zone? I don't know that I didn't understand that at all. And regarding Cura, um, the plugin seems to be relying on Dane portal specifically. So what if I do my own deployment of that? Can I make it to use my database? And where is it? Is it a Dane portal or is it in the customer's DNS domain? So this is a perfect point as well. Um, there's something, unfortunately, I was, had to rush through here. But uh, Dane portal actually just implements the standard Dane protocol, which is just part of DNS, You know, DNS secured by DNSSEC. These are just standard DNS domains that are zones that are beneath like our normal structures that zone holders have just with special protocols, um, domain names, right? And there's a lot of details hidden behind that, but really this is the public DNS, right? Obviously you can have private DNS implementations too that do Dane within your own uh, organization, and that is totally possible, and your own mail clients that can resolve that DNS uh, can indeed do that the cert resolution off Dane through that private uh, infrastructure. But that, that's kind of more like the classical PKI. But with the, when you're connected to the public DNS, you have this secure root, like you're doing DNSSEC, you're starting at the root zone, you're coming down, it's resolvable, no matter whether anybody that's hooked up, just like if you have your own name server and you have your own uh, domain on it, it's just like that. You know? So this isn't any special uh, proprietary database, this is indeed the public DNS. Dane portal is just a front end and a kind of the infrastructure, meaning we just have a specified name server for that. Yes, yeah, sure, but when I use the Dane Portal web interface to configure something, how does that end up in my zone? Because I don't remember you showing that um, the DNS provider's API key is given to Dane Portal or something. Right, that, that is done through a manual delegation. I think I might have done rushed through those slides a little bit, but like, for example, uh, we, Dane Portal will actually be serving the specific subzone for Dane. So it will have this own name server serves it, but you know, that's something it does currently, and we're looking into having more uh, like general name servers as well. But really, the delegation is just a standard delegation. Uh, just you use the NS uh, record and you put it in your parent zone, and it is delegated to Dane, Dane Portal, right? And the reason it does that is because underneath that zone, it can add the records and change the records as needed to suit the user's perspective of the each email user being able to access the domain uh, and add their own certs because Dane has their own records and the protocol for it. Um, I think there was a question on the career side as well, but I'm, I think I forgot that. I'm sorry. I, I think I can repeat it. So, okay. let, um, is so career dependent on Dane portal specifically? Yeah, that's that was the question. That's that's a perfect follow up because no, it doesn't. Uh, career is resolving through the public DNS, so it's okay. using a, a DO server but, uh, and starting from the root and just looking for the email address with the proper um, following the, the Dane protocol. So, so if I yeah. do my own deployment using absolutely, it and the doesn't cool, matter, right? Yeah, and the cool okay. thing is, Dane Portal is actually open source, so you oh, can that even was take my it next apart. question. Okay, yeah. thank you. Ah, someone from Yokubo. There was a lot of talk around Dane and things, and I, I I saw how hard you worked on this firsthand, and I really want to thank you for doing this. This thank is you. great. I hope everybody, <laughs> you know. Tries it out. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sam, for me. I really do hope uh, people are willing to give it a shot. You know, it's up and running right now, uh, both those tools and their respective sites and documentations. Hi, Lars Lehmann from NetNode. So where exactly are the secret keys for these certificates stored? Um, so there are no, so which certificates? Are you uh, talking about yeah. DNSSEC uh, no, zones? No, the user, the user certificates used for SMIME. Sure, uh, for the SMIME, the users will have them. So um, in that, we briefly showed the tool that allows users to create a certificate or key pair. That is there for convenience. It is using just a, it's a thin layer on OpenSSL. So using OpenSSL, you can generate a key pair. You have get a cert and a, and a key. And Date Portal promises that it's not going to save any of that, and it doesn't. Uh, it's open source, so you, people can verify. But basically, you're just uh, prompted to download those. And once you download them, it forgets about it. It's like one of those things where it gives you a web page to download. It's up to the user to keep track of it, technically. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so which computer generates the key? The actual key and cert, for convenience, if the user is given the option to let the server generate it, meaning run OpenSSL on the server, right? Now, obviously, we do prefer if the users come in with a proper CA cert key combo. We don't ever see the key. Definitely, we do not want users to rely on that for their end all be all. But it is a matter of convenience to let people quickly jumpstart into doing secure email. Right, but there's no proof that you don't harvest it. Um, it's a, if you can't prove it. Yeah, yeah, you are technically correct. Yeah. Right, right. If you trust that we are going to use exactly what's in the open source re repo, then yes, then yes. that would be the proof. But there is no true trust in that. In that case, perhaps maybe don't use that uh, the tool and use OpenSSL yourselves. And that's actually a very good point where we can point people at more fulsome discussion of how to make their own certs, use OpenSSL on their own operating systems as well. So that, that's a good point and, uh, and a matter of improvement for the site. So if you can improve that process where the user generates his own key on his own computer and then uploads it to use uh, and then feeds it into the DNS, that would be really, really awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it would be a matter of pointing to like kind of a run through of how to do it themselves. Uh, it's also a, um, a point worth pointing out that it is perfectly fine if you are a user that already has CA certs that you know, you're already doing SMIME and you just want to push everything on Dane, whatever you have currently, right? And it's per perfectly fine for you to keep your own key and you never use that utility at all, you know? But you're right, because the utility is up in front there, it is worth doing a bit of a stronger messaging as well. Um, but yeah, feel free to actually go up there and see and see how you feel about the messaging that it exists. I believe it is pretty cautious when it says that, you know, it is preferred that you uh, go ahead and make it yourself too. But this is just kind of a convenience tool, but great point, thank you. All right, Excellent. so. Anyone last questions? I don't think we do. Excellent, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Um, great presentation. And I think next we will have the IPv6 extension header performance and metric diagnostic, which is a very long title. So, hello, Naomi. And will Chris be bringing up the slide deck? Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I can kick you out, actually. Revoke. There we go. Let me see if maybe I can share the preloaded, because Chris's machine is being difficult. Um, here we go. Is that excellent? Yep. And you'll just tell us what to hit next? Yep. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. So um, we did some extension header testing. As I think you guys know from actually some of the presentations here too at IEPG, um, there is an outstanding question about whether IPv6 extension headers can actually be used on the internet. It's been a controversy for quite a few years. And a number of people have done studies um, showing that they don't work. Um, uh, and by and large, these studies sent um, crafted fake extension headers to a number of the very large sites uh, on the Alexa top, you know, whatever, Google, Facebook, you know, the usual suspects. And so what we were thinking 
we ourselves have been hard at work on an extension header ourselves, and we wish that to work. And we do not wish to throw all our work away. So if extension headers don't work, we have been wasting our time. <laughs> we wish not to do that. So a very brief explanation. This is of particular interest at end user sites, uh, enterprises, because we need to do very quick triage as to say, is the problem at a, at a hot, very high level, is it in the server or is it in the network? And then we can dispatch uh, the right set of technicians to, um, to go to either way. And the way we do this is we put timing and sequence number information inside an IPv6 destination option. Next. So um, the way we did our testing is um, first we modified a FreeBSD kernel to send our PDM destination option with every packet. Um, and what could, the reason we did the modification in the kernel is that we wanted to test uh, real data going through and we wanted it to come through all the time. So we patched the kernel. And so then what we did is we chose locations throughout the world because we wanted to make sure that we were going to uh, multiple transit providers. And so you can see, you know, Warsaw, T Toronto, Mumbai, uh, and so forth is where we were. Uh, next. Uh, and you can see uh, we have quite a few choices of locations from this uh, small hosting service. It does become important that it was a, um, a small, quote unquote, like no name uh, hosting service and not like one of the brand name providers like, um, you know, uh, Amazon, uh, Azure and so on. Uh, next. And so you can see our PDM locations are exactly where um, I had said before that they were. Uh, next. Uh, so let me first give a shout out to our sponsors, the India Internet Engineering Society for um, uh, paying for these little servers all over the world and for NITK Suratkal for providing uh, the young people who did a bunch of the code. Thank you so much. And then um, uh, our own organization, which is a consortium of industry, which is very interested in this kind of information. So next. So this is test results. So what I did was I took a very, very large FTP. Uh, you can see there's a ton of kilobytes to download. And um, I tested from Toronto. I, I based out of Toronto and tested to all the locations. Uh, and you can see here, and PDM is, in, uh, is attached to every single packet. And you can see here that the FTP worked. And in the background, I took a packet trace because packets don't lie. I mean, people can lie, but packets don't lie. Next. So you can see there is PDM headers. I took the PSN this packet field out of the PDM destination option header and put it right out there. And you can see it's in all the packets. Uh, by the way, all these traces are available for anyone to look at. We have them here. And you can see surprisingly that the large FTP was fragmented and validly so. So you can see fragment headers, of large fragment headers also going to the other end. Next, please. So you can see here that everything went successful. Next, please. Here is the destination option header out of the trace and you can see it is a valid destination option with all the data filled in. The timing 
is extremely important because those are delta times that are calculated when I get a packet from one end, I save it and I calculate the delta off of there. And so you can see both ends are properly processing the previous PDM that was also received at their end. Uh, next, please. Uh, now you can see both the uh, PDM and the fragment header. Uh, again, Wireshark is a delightful tool. Next, please. Mm -hmm. So in the bottom line, all the traces worked. I mean, all the FTPs worked with this very large um, file. We also have uh, Apache set up to these, and we have been doing testing from here um, over to, um, I believe, Warsaw, and we also have Melbourne set up. So these sites um, are set up to do Apache over the IETF network. And if you wish to see the results of those, please come see us at the hackathon. And I will leave it. I won't tell you whether it worked or not. You'll have to come <laughs> down and see for yourselves. Uh, next, please. So then some of the people were like, you know, internally, some of people in the group are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. OK, so you're using one hosting service. Why are your results so different from other people's? Are these people using some kind of overlay network? Now, keep in mind, this is a small, no-name um, service, which I did not think had the money to have their own servers all over the world. But nevertheless, one wishes to verify one's results. So I sent them an email, and I said, do you guys have some kind of overlay network and they said no we do not we go over the public internet uh, next please i then wished to validate what they said so i did a trace route we have also done mtr between these sites and you can see there is at least one and actually multiple transit networks involved which also all passed these extension headers correctly. Next, please. So why are our results so different from other people's? So what we believe is that we are using a real data and a real extension header and not fake data, which may validly be dropped by thing by people we are also not going to the alexa top um uh, whatever um and this becomes important because we said well let's see whether um our results are also consistent with other people's and indeed if you use the large hosting companies and go to the alexa top whatever indeed there are issues but the question is well, why? Because in our mind, uh, these things are not being blocked at the core of the internet. So where are they being blocked? Next, please. So what we did was we did pings and trace routes from our PDM enabled machine. Remember, we have a patch to the kernel which will send our destination option out with every packet, whether it is a UDP packet or ICMP packet, which are both used for traceroute or ping. And so what we wanted to see was, let's say that our PDM enabled traceroute does not get through, but the non PDM enabled traceroute does get through, where does it stop? For example, if there are eight hops between um, ourselves and say Facebook, then is it always dropped at hop um, seven? Or is it always dropped at hop three? Or 
Is there a random number where it is dropped? Um, the question being is, did it get to the uh, destination network or the edge of the destination network, or was it dropped randomly somewhere else? Next, please. And you can see in the traceroute packet capture that all these packets come back, and you can see the PSNs showing that there was PDM. And next, please. And so what we are doing now is summarizing all this information. And the important thing is to do a DNS resolution for the, uh, the hop of interest. Um, because it turns out that going to the Alexa top whatever, you're actually not going to Facebook or Google, you're probably going to some CDN. Uh, that is, you're going to Akamai Cloudflare at all. And so where is it dropped? Next, please. I shall also leave that for next time. <laughs> we, as, we, will have, we will have a draft in V6 Ops summarizing all our results. And, and I'm, I'm only sort of kidding about, about some of this. It's like we are, we're actually doing all these DNS resolutions and we're having some internal discussions which we wish to be completely in accord on, on exactly what is it that we're seeing. Um, and so once the team um, is, uh, is in sync, then we will present the results. Um, we welcome collaborators. We wish for others to test and validate our results. And if you wish to collaborate, we can make um, our virtual machine uh, with PDM enabled, and you may test for yourself. Again, we want to be careful because if our results are indeed correct, letting this kind of thing loose on the internet um, uh, for anyone to use at all for any reason could create some <clears throat> potential issues. So please come talk to us at the hackathon and hack demo and we can uh, show you the results. Uh, if you wish to test yourself, uh, we can work with you and you can do a trace route ping or actually go into our Apache and take a packet trace for yourself and see what happens. Any questions? Is that it? Any questions? Oh, question. <laughs> okay. So thank you. I think this was fascinating and how different these results are to some of the other ones. I think it's interesting and hopefully we can find out, you know, why. Why? Yeah. <laughs> we welcome collaborators, even collab and especially if collaborators have interest in in uh, <clears throat> discussing or rather fighting amongst ourselves as to why we're seeing what we're seeing. <laughs> Jen? Hi, Jen Minkova. Actually, I don't think they're really different from what other people see because most of the results I've seen is packet packets being dropped near the last near the destination network or even source network if it's user CP, right? So trends, it's normally let them through. So I do not see really conflict with your results with any other, right? Like, so it's not, not normally the destination network drops it. And if your vantage points permit them, yeah, I'm not surprised you see them going through. And a question, is there any reason you're doing DNS lookups instead of looking at IS numbers? Because I think IS number might give you better indication who actually controls that hop. We can certainly do that. We can, the reason I was doing DNS, uh, well, I, I'm not, okay, so a couple, um, all right, let me answer that one and then I'll go back to some of the other comments you had. It's because to me, I want, it's like, if for me, it seems really obvious. It's like, it's like, if it, how close did it get? So like if Akamai, for example, not to pick on Akamai, a wonderful company, is if they're hosting your site and you're, <laughs> and you're already at the Akam, edge of the Akamai network and then you get dropped, then 
I think the question is, is our packets being dropped at random points in the core of the internet mm -hmm. or at the edge of the destination yeah. network? Those are two very different questions. Yeah, right? I totally agree. I'm just trying, you're trying to find out which network drops the packet. Right. So I'm trying to understand why you are using DNS to find out who owns that IP address instead of using IS number attribution for this address. Because DNS might be, it might, uh, PTR might not even exist. While that address definitely belongs to some IS number, which indicates who owns the device, usually. Sure, sure. We can we can do either. You know, either one. I mean, I mean, yeah. Fine. We can use AS number. Yeah. Yeah. Any any other questions? As I say, we welcome uh, collaborators. And and if you want to see our results live, um, we're happy. Uh, to talk to you at the at the hackathon, and yeah, maybe present, come back next time as well. We'll get. Oh, next, happy next to. IAPG. No, happy to do that. Hi, I um, just wanted to put a one that was in the chat. Um, Anna asked, "Do you plan to do any hop by hop extension header testing?" We're actually doing that in the hackathon. We're trying to break the RFCs, so yeah, come and we'll present. Actually, we we're looking specifically at hop by hop and. The results are a little bit interesting, a little bit scary also, hence the security considerations, and we'll present more on it at the hackathon. It, by the way, An Anthony is a member of our hackathon team, and he's and and uh, Liquid is is um, we're happy to have them working with us at the hackathon. And I'm part of these troublemakers too, and I just wanted to add to what Anthony said, and and in response to that question, that a key determining factor of why these results are occurring, we think, is the type of extension header, like hot by hot might be different than DOH, and the content of the data in that. Correct. So those are yeah. key factors we think. With, so with, good yes. question to whoever asked that. Yeah, 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 great. Yeah, you guys, great team. And yes, I we think that it would it should not be a surprise if fake data is dropped. I think that actually speaks to good code at somebody's firewall. <laughs> Hello. Hi, good evening, folks. A little bit nasty question. Please. Uh, <laughs> what kind of bad conclusions uh, do you expect to result from your claim that packets cannot lie? <laughs> 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 That's a good one. That's a good one. If they can, they just don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, yeah, yes, yes, yes. You know what? I'm not going to distract on some people who claim to have um, packet traces of voting machines. <laughs> I, anyway, okay, okay. I'll just stop right there. I will stop right there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Thank you very much. And our final presentation for the IAPG this time is going to be Jeff Houston, who is going to be presenting on a quick look at quick. The red square. Good morning, all. Um, thank you. This is a very quick look at the use of the quick protocol out in the wild. Um, and I want to sort of compare and contrast theory and practice. Next slide. Um, next slide. Someone? Yeah, okay. Uh, you all know this. Next slide. Well, you all know that too. Next slide. Yeah, pushing a lot of buttons very quickly. So as some of you might be aware, we've actually tried to do large-scale measurement by actually with, with some support from Google by, by actually enrolling around 20 million people a day through use of an adver advertisement campaign where the ad actually contains a scripted set of URL fetches. And, and if you look at the DNS and regard DNS query labels as actually microcoded instructions and make the servers give unique answers every time a query hits it, you can actually bypass most of the internet's normal caching and expose the client to your own servers. So unlike lots of other measurements, like measurements, the Alexa, where one point measures 
a hundred or a thousand or a million sort of remote points, we're actually enlisting millions of unique users every day to come to a small collection of servers which are on VMs around the world. Now, we did this initially to actually dispel the myth around IPv6 deployment is big, non-existent, whatever, uh, with very little measurement behind it. And so we started doing this ad campaign to actually enroll a whole bunch of users and say, here's the thing you can get to only if you have v6. And here's another thing you can get to, which is dual protocol, and we're kind of interested which protocol you use. This was actually a revelation because it kind of dispelled at the time the myth that there was an awful lot of v6 around there at the time uh, and exposed exactly where it was and why. And we thought, well, we can go further. And we started looking at DNSSEC because, again, if you say, well, here's a name that's not validly signed, the number of people that go to it is kind of, well, you're not validating, are you? You've got a resolver out there that just doesn't care about the DNSSEC validation. And then we started around IPv6 fragmentation and, yeah, extension headers and, yeah, completely different outcomes to, to where Nalani is reporting, um, completely different. It has a lot to do with the experimental technique. We have no control over what end users run this. It's basically the ad campaigns do all the enrolling. So this is really the internet as measured from the outside, you and I, as we look into the infrastructure. And so we thought, well, okay, let's actually expose the same thing for quick. Next slide. Um, and, and this is relatively vanilla stuff. Um, Nginx has now got a uh, beta version of its server that has all the quick functions enabled. And so we're running 121.7. Uh, we looked at what Apple have done recently with iOS. I think 15 was the first to actually release it. It might have been earlier, I don't know, but certainly in 15, where uh, those devices in particular will actually do an HTTPS DNS query and look for that um, ALPN record. And so we effectively create a dynamically synthesized ALPN value for every single unique DNS name that we're using. And so the HTTPS record is there predominantly for those Apple devices. And of course, there's the alt service header, which has been traditionally used by Chrome. Now, I should make a note about that because you're only going to see that there's an alt service record if you go and get it. And if you don't go and get it, you don't know if it's there. So you need to actually get the thing presented twice. Now, with ads, we normally say, here's a list of URLs. They've all got unique names. You only see them once. It doesn't matter what you put in there. It isn't going to get triggered. So we then revised the script slightly. And for a couple of these ones, particularly this one, we wait. Um, and we actually wait for two seconds, which is an interesting number. Um, we wait for two seconds. And then we tell the user, go get it again. Same DNS name, but we alter the HTTP query args and hopefully altering those query args seems to defeat most values of HTTPS proxying if that's what you're behind. Um, so the idea is for about a fifth of our experiments, we do two fetches. For everyone else, we just do one. Next slide. Yeah, said that. Next. So these are the big answers we've got. We've only started running this in June at sort of a massive level of deployment. We're doing around 15 to 20 million experiments every day across a unique batch of users. Thank you, Ad Engine. And I'm contrasting the second fetch to the first fetch, as I can see the difference. The first fetch is really, really low, 1%. So if you put something out there, even with the DNS um, HTTPS record, about one in 100 users will actually go and say, well, I'm going to use HTTP3. I'm going to use Quick. The other 99% go, nah. Uh, if you do the second fetch, and in our case, the browser is scripted with a two-second delay. Now, I don't know what browsers do inside browser code. I don't know if any human alive knows what browsers do inside the browser code. There's an awful lot of code and a huge amount of complexity. Um, we issue the get command inside the script after a two-second wait. What happens after that is browser magic, 
but the number is still pretty low, 3.5%. Uh, next slide. So where? Um, ads give us an enormous amount of detail, origin AS, network, etc. They also were the rudimentary form of geolocation. Uh, we use MaxMind uh, <laughs> with a huge amount of kerfuffle recently to accommodate Apple's private relay service. Thank you, Apple. Really appreciate it. Because uh, a lot of folk use it, and you've got to sort of flick the countries around to map Apple's map. Um, so this is now corrected for Apple. Thank you. Uh, but there are some surprises going on as to what's sort of used extensively and what's not. And what I'm seeing in front of me is much better than what you're seeing there. So if you look online, you'll actually see that the Scandies are green, India is red. There's some kind of weird geolocation thing going on inside browsers. Because I'm pretty damn sure it's nothing to do with networks. Next slide. So that's curious. And here's a table. Malta, 28% um, on the second query, 1.4% on the first. Central African Republic in, in Africa. Uh, wouldn't have guessed it. Um, but this is not, if you will, a predictable list. But there are certainly systematic variations there around locales. Next slide. Hi, a question. Quick question. Have you, asked, <laughs> have you asked Chrome whether they have an experiment running that would match this? Have I also... Sorry, I'll do that. Have you yeah. asked Chrome whether they have an experiment running that would match that? I've asked Apple, but not okay. Chrome. Uh, and part of the idea of airing this is there will be questions to Chrome as well, and, and I'm getting there. Um, let's actually look at the first query and sort that country list by first query hit. And all of a sudden, the Scandies come right up. Denmark, 8% of users in Denmark do a first query hit on HTTP3, whereas the second query is only slightly more. So there's certainly variations going on between first and second query. Next slide. Actually, this is one of the few lists. Go back one, sorry. One of the few lists where the Faroe Islands features. So all 10 of them and their sheep are uh, busy doing a relatively significant amount of querying using Quick on the first query. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so I have some questions here that I actually thought I really would like to understand this a bit better and sort of see what's going on. And, and the first is, which are the clients, which are the browser clients that are actually performing Quick and why? First and second fetch variation. Um, the second thing is if you, you read the Quick specs, you can't fragment. You just can't. It says, do not fragment these UDP packets. So what are the packet sizes quick sessions actually use? And in particular, I'm interested in what the clients do when they open the session and start talking to our servers. So in other words, not what I select, but what is being selected out there as the MSS values for quick. Um, what's the connection failure rate? Because there's been an awful lot of fear and distrust about UDP port 443. Is it filtered like crazy? Does it get through like glass? You know, what's going on? And, and in this case, the question I had was, is quick faster or not? Is it really quicker? Next. So let's go quickly and try and answer some of those. Whoever's driving this. Um, this is an odd table. Like all tables, it needs explanation. So this is the, I, the OS clients as determined by the browser stream. What hardware are you running on or what operating system? Everybody lies, right? So in some ways, this is just the lies I got told by the browser in their browser stream. Yeah. There's an awful lot of Windows 3 out there, you know, yeah, right. Um, so to some extent, it's slightly cloudy, but there's patterns going on. They aren't comparable horizontally, it's vertical. So I'm just breaking down. I have separate tests that run only TCP and TLS, completely independent of the quick stuff. And for those, I say, well, what clients does the ad actually get to? So around 5.5% of clients out there for an ad use iOS. Another 1% uses Mac. 84.5% uses Android. This is sort of the market share of, of platforms. Um, 
Windows still exists, and you Linux folk, you've got a lot of work to do if you want market share. So they add vertically, not horizontally. So let's look at the first fetch. And what you actually find is, of all the folk who use Quick immediately, 93% is iOS, 2.8% is macOS, and the rest don't count, and they're probably lying. So this really is an Apple thing that's actually looking for the HTTPS record and acting upon it. Now, I only had 1%, but at least 6% of clients are actually using that platform. So it seems that Apple's doing around a one in four filtering and only selectively going to Quick as determined somehow by Apple, not by anything else. Interesting. And on the second fetch, it's predominantly the Android platform with a little bit of iOS. And again, there are liars and, and all kinds of stuff because it's the browser string, but predominantly it's an Android behavior. Next slide, please. So let's go to the browsers and the browser clients, and this kind of sort of sorts it out. The world is Chrome. No one else matters. Just it is. 91% of folk that we flush out in ads are running the Chrome browser, or so they report. So it could be variants, web kits, whatever, who knows. But 91% basically say, I'm Chrome. Uh, on first fetch, 93% say they're Safari. So this again says, it's Apple. Uh, interestingly, on the second fetch, um, a huge amount in Chrome, but also some degree of use in Safari. Some of you iOS users seem to prefer, oh sorry, some of you Android users, I really don't understand that. It's higher than it should be. Yeah. Next. So who does it? Well, it's Apple, it's Safari, it's the DNS HTTPS record. It only does one in four. It only does about one in four. Not sure why. The Apple folk can answer that much better than me. Um, Chrome, why isn't it everyone? Why aren't I seeing 94%? Because if it really is a second fetch, waiting and asking in should trigger it. That conversion rate, as I observe it, is tiny. We will return to this. Next slide. Okay, so park that thought. Yeah. On to the next one. What's the packet size? Um, the sizes that folk send me tend to correlate pretty well with the RFCs. 46% are exactly 1,200 octets on that first packet coming in, the packet that's padded up, that the spec says must be at least 1,200 octets. 46% go, yeah, okay, fine, 1,200. Uh, a few folk are more inventive, we'll go 1,250. Um, yay, good on you. And a few more folk go, we'll go 1,252. Okay. And a very small number go, we go uh, 1,354. Yay then. Um, nothing higher. So whatever you think, there's no one kind of pushing the boundary here because predominantly on that first packet, you have no idea what the path into you is. And so 1350 is about the extent of which people are going to say, okay, let's go that far, but no further. If that first packet is fragmented, nothing works. Next slide. Um, quick connection loss. This is unusual. Uh, this is like seeing a 99% drop rate for hop by hop extension headers in V6, except the other way around. I look at packets that reach me, so I have no idea what the client attempted because I can't instrument them. But what I see is when I get that initial connection packet, and Quick has enough exposed that you know it's an initial connection packet with an initial connection ID, I answer, I should get a second packet. So I look for the amount of time when I don't get the second packet. And on one day, I had 19 million of these sort of initials. I had 46,000 that never got the sec, never sent me the second packet. The failure rate is 0.24%. Now, that's an awful lot of equipment out there that thoroughly trusts UDP port 443 incoming in response to an outgoing. Yay, good on them. It's much higher than, sorry, that is much lower than I thought. I was expecting something to 3%, a bit like the V6 failure rate. V6, by the way, in TCP has around using the same methodology, 
around 2, 2.4% failure. The V6 connections don't work. And it seems to be that the filters close to the customer will let the packets out, but won't let the SYNAC packets back in. I thought the same would happen here. It does not. Your 443 makes it out, 443 makes it in. Surprising. Next slide. Is it faster? Um, this is getting a lot harder with Quick because looking at packets is difficult because most of it's encrypted. And actually trying to trace packet and ACK when the entire thing is potentially multi-threaded tends to make my brain explode. So I went for rough and ready. And inside the browser, yay, is a timer. And I have no idea how accurate this timer is. I have no idea if it's just a random number or whatever. But it does seem to be that if it takes longer to load, the browser's timer value is more time than if it loads quickly. And I think that's about as accurate as you get. So what I did is I asked the browsers to go, well, how long did it take you to fetch this using Quick and not using Quick? Because there's a bunch of folk who don't use it. And every user actually gets to do Quick and non-Quick. So I take the user and compare their Quick and non-Quick timer values. Next slide. And so this is the center point of each individual user where I see quick and not quick and compare the two values because it's the same server. It's the same network path in theory. So if quick is faster, uh -huh. the time elapsed to complete the entire transaction should be lower. It should be on the right hand side of the zero point. If quick is slower, it'll be on the left. There's a huge amount where it said, nah, same time, which is fine. Um, but there's certainly a bias to faster. And these are in milliseconds. It's sort of visible around the first 50 to 100 milliseconds as being most obvious. It's clearer in a cumulative distribution. Next slide. Um, where around two thirds of the time, the browser believes the quick fetch was faster. Now, I've just got to take the browser's word for it. I don't have a clue what's inside a browser, and I never want to know. But if I just do that, what you see is for two thirds of the time, the browser is reporting that the HTTP3 load was faster. Question? But yes, can you come back to, to a slide before? Above the compar comparison? When you say TCP over TLS, you say HTTP2? Or? Do I care whether it's HTTP1 or HTTP2? Uh, no, I don't. It's just you're not using Quick, and if you're coming to my server and you're not using Quick, you're not using um, TLS anymore. It's all <laughs> TLS. So it really is TCP over TLS versus Quick is what I'm comparing. Yeah, I'm but, but yeah, it's just because uh, uh, HTTP1 does not have header compression, so it, it may change a lot as a, as a result. I didn't look. OK, good. Yeah, yeah just did not look. In fact, what I was doing was saying, it's either an HTTPS fetch or it's an HTTPS slash three. That's all. So, you know, I didn't factor in header compression. Uh, go forward two slides, were we? <laughs> yeah. So this is a summary of what I said next. Now, my answers are weird. And I tried to find some other public answers. And, and the most immediate one is on the Cloudflare radar site. Where they're reporting served from Cloudflare, 30% of their web fetches occur over Quick. So what I'm seeing is far, far lower. Now, I have no reason to doubt that. It's a fine number. But again, this sort of, why are we seeing very different things? Next slide. So I certainly agree, but I actually think Cloudflare is low. Because if Quick is enabled by default in Chrome, it should basically, all these connections should head towards Quick. And, and so in Cloudflare's case, I suppose the real question is, to what extent is Cloudflare seeing first fetch versus subsequent fetch? What's their breakdown? Now, I can't see in behind Cloudflare, so I really don't know. And maybe that 30% is a reflection on how many times the client got there once 
received the signal saying, if you go there again quickly within the cache time, you'll go and use quick, but they didn't get there. So only 30% of their folk went there twice. Or Chrome uh, is not doing it all the time. I have no idea. So that number is kind of difficult to unpick, but ours is certainly a lot lower. Um, so why is my number so low? I think that two second timer is way too fast for browser behavior inside uh, Chrome, personally. I'm like, when I say at the script level, wait two seconds and do another fetch, the incredible internal scheduling issues of the Chrome browser with their multiple execution queues, et cetera, et cetera, make that two second timer almost a random spin. And I may well be doing the second fetch way too quickly but that's something only Chrome's going to answer, and I, for one, am not going to look at the source code. Uh, so I might be being too aggressive here. I could make that a really long time, but you focus users, when you see an ad displayed, if it's displayed more than 10 seconds, you go and click the X box and kill the ad. So if I bring that timer out, you're just not going to see the ad anymore, and I'm not going to get the measurements. That's why the, the timing's so aggressive. Next slide. Um, so I don't understand a few things. I started actually looking at how many folk ask for that HTTPS, um, that HTTPS resource record. A lot. Three to four times the number of folk that actually do the first fetch. So surely, if you knew about that HTTPS record, you were going to do quick if you could, and if you get a positive signal, yeah, I can do this, you'd go and do it. But they don't. Somehow there is a control function sitting inside that Safari browser that goes, yeah, I could, but I choose not to. And my suspicion is with the country-based variations that this is a locale that changes the default behavior of Safari. But you know, that's for Apple to confirm and for me to guess. Um, the question about that two second scripted wait time in Chrome, you know, I don't actually know how long I should be waiting for, and I don't know how long Chrome keeps it going, well, I found this directive, how long is that cache of that directive lasting? I have no idea. And the other thing about Chrome is, will it always use quick? Or if you live in Burma or Vietnam, will it do it differently than if I live in Australia? You know, are there locales that change that default behavior? And the same question for Safari. To what extent is this behavior triggered by various locale setting defaults? I think that's it. Is there another slide? One more slide. Oh, okay. Whoa. And there's a web page where all this gunk is, is there uh, as pretty pictures and graphs. Uh, any questions? Or well, preferably answers, because, you know. <laughs> I have no idea some of this stuff. Uh, question about, uh, I guess maybe back one slide, uh, or yeah, either slide 12 or 16, I can't remember, but uh, your HTTPS response, does it have an IPv6 or IPv4 address hint in it? No hints, just the ALPN field. So my guess is there's connection racing going on here. It's happy eyeballs between HTTP3 and HTTP2. And if you don't return the IP address, in the HTTPS query, because these are one-use domain names, the client is also doing an A record lookup and a quad A record lookup and an HTTPS lookup. It gets the A or quad A and the HTTPS. Let's just say even say it all at the same time. What it's going to start doing is maybe TLS HTTP2. You know, the HTTP3 comes back and says, you know, like it, there might be, I don't, depending on the exact ordering, it might help if there's a, a hint. A hint. Thanks, Eric. I will add a hint this week to the experiment and see if the numbers change. Yes, you could well be right. You know, in some cases, this is a black box. I don't work for these companies. So I have no idea. But yeah, it could be very useful. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Is Anthony in the room or no? Yeah. Not sure if it's a question or a possible suggestion of a solution, but how much does ad blocking pose an impact on the test data, particularly some vendors, OSs are more prone to doing ad block by default and do not track and all that. This is a larger question of selection bias. 
because I get to see the folk who get to see ads, right? And so some networks, um, there's a mobile provider in South Korea, I think it's SKA, seems to be massively ad blocking. That's fine. I don't get to see them at all. And so whether you use quick or not doesn't matter. If you get to see the ad, the full measurement set runs. Um, right now, oddly enough, I don't get to see Russia very clearly. We all know why. Um, and at some points, I don't get to see Iran very clearly for, I guess, similar reasons. China, quite clear, oddly enough. The ad systems work in China just fine using you know, double clicks infrastructure. A lot of folk use ads. So the selection bias is there, absolutely, for ad blocking. But it's not for each individual ad for each individual type. That's a different problem about censorship and the labels that folk use. My labels are as bland as they get. And so I'm trying desperately not to say, this is content that is banned, all that kind of stuff. My labels don't do that. So yes, it's a problem, but not in this context. Thanks. I was also going to ask about slide 16. I think you mentioned the uh, IPv6 connection failure rate versus the quick connection yeah, failure rate. Uh, is this, um, uh, what's the V4 versus V6 split for UDP 443? So your IPv6 connection failure rate is that? Is, is around, okay. TCP TLS or is that, I mean? What I see in V6 is I see a SYN, I send back a SYNAC, I never get the ACK. Hmm. The failure rate is approximately 2, 2.5%. It's, mm -hmm. it's tracked on one of these pages. Mm -hmm. You'd say, well, what's it compared to V4? And that's kind of weird because the defaults to get you to this point were V4. You had to speak TCP to the server to get the ad up and running. And so in some ways, the folk who fail on four don't get to see much of the ad at all in mm -hmm. any case. So that's why I've never tracked the V4 failure rate to the same as I've tracked V6. So, but, but I'm asking is, is the UDP 443 success rate the same in V6 and V4? Or is it skewed in one way? I haven't differentiated that out. Okay. And, and I, I'm still concerned that I'm only measuring the second half. I have no idea about the packet coming out because the client can't tell me I tried and I failed. Mm -hmm. So this is, if it comes out and I answer, these are the ones that respond. But again, Eric, um, I'll, I'll check V4, V6. Uh, and curious. if they're all V6, that's a, a bit of a weird smoking gun. Yes. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, brief question. Um, do you verify that the initial that you see at the server was triggered by the client, by the ad, actually? Did you verify that the initial that you see at your server was triggered by the advertisement? Every advertisement has a unique generated DNS name yes. at the initial conversation of the script. So all of the queries with that DNS string, which is actually, again, a piece of microcode, ultimately came from the same client. So even if you're using Apple Private Relay, that name filters through and emerges, it was you. Now, yes, there's tracking, there's logging, there's query replay. So the label has a timer field okay. inside its label. If it's more than 10 seconds, it's not you, it's a replay, I really don't care. It's something else. Okay. So yes, I know it's you, almost irrespective of how. So even if you're behind a very aggressive NAT and you're changing your source address every RTT, which is about as extreme as you get with Quick, it's still you. Okay. It's still the same DNS name. Okay, and so in particular, we exclude also scanners and spoofed IP addresses? <sighs> to the extent I can, yes. There's an awful lot of scanners that trigger really quickly to the user as if there's a real-time feed from the user's browser to the scanner, which happens a lot. They're much more challenging to detect. Hi, this is Peter from the ESEC. Uh, I would also like to uh, ask a question on this slide. Um, I assume there's also some failure rate uh, for the second packet when you do uh, TLS over TCP, especially in slow mobile environments, for example. And I wondered what that number is and if it's different from this one and whether you have parameterized the measurements by mobile versus 
desktop, for example, by IP address or user agent or something. So are you referring to a failure rate in TLS? In TCP. Oh, so as I said, that's what I referred to in V6. Sin, oh, okay. sin AC. Okay. I don't get the AC. And again, okay. I can only measure in six because to get to the ad, four had to be working. So the failure rate in four doesn't really matter in a straight TCP thing. All the ones that fail in four never got enrolled in the measurement, sadly. Well, but I guess even if it doesn't seem to matter, there may still be the possibility in V4 that it does fail at this stage with TCP. And if that number be comparable to this one, then I think the conclusion that this number here stems from client-side filtering of incoming 443 packets over UDP is not necessarily true. I think the point to take home is that this isn't 20%. Yes, yes. And it isn't 10%. And that's great. It's, right. actually, it's actually really bloody good. Yes. And it's about as good as this technique will ever give you. Yes. And it's right. probably the measurement, not the infrastructure. And so as far as I'm aware, once you get to this point, network blocking on incoming UDP 443, for those who are doing quick, doesn't seem to exist. Yay. Okay, then I agree. I thought you were saying this number is from that cause, and that's what I was questioning. Okay, good. Um, then uh, you have this um, diagram that shows the results that quick connections are quicker than non-quick connections. Back two slides. Oh, uh, for, forward again. Yeah. Yeah, I don't necessarily need the, the diagram. Yep. So my question is if um, there are uh, shared results where the DNS lookup would benefit for one part if you do it first. So perhaps the, the quick lookup is always the second one, then it may be faster for that reason. I thought you thought about when, this, but perhaps not. So When um, I asked the browser in my uh, script, to measure the elapsed wall clock time when it's given a URL to fetch, mm -hmm. I have no idea what it's measuring. None. When I ask 20 million a day to measure it, I'm relying on the fact that no matter what stupidities happen inside that browser, it's all the same stupidity. And so the structural difference between these two collections of measurements is the transport protocol and a bit of the DNS. And therefore, this is relatively rough and ready. It's not a measure of packet RTT times or anything like that. It's just simply the browser's view of the elapsed time. And you go, well, what does that mean? I would say, go ask the browser folk. I have no idea. Right, but in case it does include any latencies from DNS, for example, and if there's a bias by always first doing the non-quick connection and then doing the quick connection, you could average that out by randomizing the order across clients. And 50% clients doing quick first and then non-quick and the other 50% doing the other way around. That might average out some of it. The and browsers, I wonder if it when I give them an ordered list of things to do, they almost never appear on my servers in that order. The browsers seem to add their own random, the universe is noisy component. <laughs> and it is. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, yes, that's all I got. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thanks, Peter. Hi, John O'Brien, UPenn. Uh, just a, checking my understanding, when you say that in order for the browser to participate in the measurement, IPv4 must be working, am I to infer that that means that the ad platform is an IPv4 only ad platform? No. So I don't understand. Can you help? Oh, me there's understand? a lot more mechanics about limitations in ad delivery networks and what we are trying to do. We originally had scripted an ad that when we went off to the ad machinery, it said, run this set of code. And we kept on changing things. And every time we did that, we had to go to the god of advertising saying, could you please approve our new ad? And as far as I'm aware, Google is an incredible advocate of AI. Incredible. There's not a human in sight in the entire ad machinery platform. So when you submit a new ad in, the answer is random. Yes, approved. No, not approved. Yes, wait for another day. And we got pretty frustrated with this, you know, understandably. And so what we did instead was to go, okay, we're going to load a skeleton inside the ad machinery, which then is its first thing to do is come back to us going, hi, give me some, some tasks. 
so we could change the tasks without changing the ad. Yay, that step is V4. Why? To maximize the reek, because at that point we were fixated on measuring V6. And so in some ways the V4 always has to work for this entire thing to flow, flow through. So don't blame the ads, don't blame Google, blame me. That was the way we designed it. Yes, it could be dual stack, da 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 da, -da but in some ways this stuff works and Google has approved it. Yay, very scared to touch it. Thanks. Thanks. No other questions? So do, do you plan to, to use uh, the quick extension you see name and spin bit to make additional measurements? We do full packet capture, yeah. full packet capture. There's an awful lot of packets sitting in a you know, spinning storage out there somewhere. Do I plan to look at it? Um, <laughs> good question. Currently we're fixated on extension headers. Uh, we'll probably get back to quick once yeah, some I, of these I, questions I, get resolved. The data is there, never looked. I asked the question because it's something that is activated by the client. It's already yeah. part of the implementation, but it's a client-side activation. This is why, uh, You've got to look for it, and that's hours in the day, people. Unfortunately, I can't expose the data sets. Okay. There's an awful lot of privacy issues because you're seeing way too much of end users that I think anyone's comfortable yeah, yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't want me exposing it. I don't want to expose it. It doesn't get exposed. No, but, but my question was if you plan in the future to, to, to ask the client to activate this feature to make a, a lost measurement uh, somewhere in the past. You see? It's about your connection lost. Uh, if topic. Nginx has it for free, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> if Nginx doesn't, it's probably not going to happen. It, it's mostly to, to enable uh, on-pass uh, measurements. Okay. Great. We're done. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to the presenters, as always. And we will see you next time in London. 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 Woo. And if anybody's got any suggestions for things they'd like to present on, start thinking of about them now. <laughs>